Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 490. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's February 18th, 2019. Well, good morning, George. Welcome to another pro... You, you're wearing your Mr. Rogers uniform. It's President's Day, Washington's birthday, so the office is closed, uh, but it's still the church is just busy and noisy. I have people in the other room, and but uh, on uh, federal holidays, I don't wear a collar. Uh, okay. Now, I'm not doing a religious service. Well, that's fine. I had just watched the documentary on Mr. Rogers with uh, my family the other day, he did 831 episodes. Mm -hmm. That is amazing, the service he did uh, for PBS and uh, helping uh, console, educate, and uh, uh, teach a, a generation of uh, two-year-olds to six-year-olds and it's something else. Um, before we get too busy here, this is more of a casual show. There's a bunch of little stories to talk about. If you're looking for something earth-shattering, you can probably squit, uh, skip this episode, but uh, if you're looking for just good banter about Anglicans and communication and uh, what is right and wrong with our church, you found the right channel. Uh, so before we get started, it would be wonderful if you took a moment to like our episode and our channel, our show, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube. If you could share this with other people, um, that would be wonderful too. We got so many wonderful comments on the last show that was really interesting. And I think, George, you're going to talk about the, the Communion Partners one. And uh, we like that a lot. We read them. We don't have time to respond to all of them because George is a full-time minister. Uh, Gavin is as busy as can be. And I run an IT business, and then I work 60 hours a week. How I can do Anglican TV is beyond me. I just It just works. So, George, uh, how's your week going? Well, it's just Monday. Hopefully, just it'll be Monday. a great week. Well, it's President's Day, and I was thinking about this uh, yesterday because I was bored. The only president I really am fond of as a president, because it was probably my formative years, um, is Ronald Reagan. Now, and when I say fond of, somebody in my lifetime. Uh, certainly, we were taught about how great Abraham Lincoln was, and you know, trying to restore. I, I'm partial to James K. Polk, but you know, <laughs> yeah, I know you go way back. And <laughs> how old is your lifetime? And so, you know, I I think about my lifetime. He was very formative and fatherly and presidential in my late teens and early 20s and he is kind of what i had as a vision of a president now everybody has well, every generation you know, robert browning the poet did come up with a uh, a line uh the uh, lark on the wing the snail and the thorn reagan in the white house god in his heaven and all is right with the world and now if you're from a different generation, you're going to have your leader that you know, was formational in, in who you were and what you understood leadership to be. If you're from England, you know, some of you are like, well, you know, Margaret Thatcher was, she was the, the queen's bee. She knew what she was doing and uh, uh, she helped lead us during the Cold War. If you're a different generation, you're, you're like, wow, this guy Winston was really cool. You know, here in America, lots of people look up to JFK. Um, well, th this is always diff difficult, Kevin, because the, our cultures and our not self knowledge are so different from Canadians, Australians, England. We have this such a wide audience. Someone said to me, uh, Ruth Gledhill's husband uh, said to me that Rowan Williams was the uh, uh, Rowan Williams as an archbishop reminded him of the Prime Minister uh, Wilson, and I'm trying to basically get my head around uh, how. Uh, you know, a British prime minister during the labor crises of the 1970s. And, you know, it just didn't speak to me. So um, this is an American-centered show today, folks. <laughs> most, many of you from overseas will have uh, no knowledge of uh, Reagan. <laughs> That's what we speak. Well, I think a lot of them do because the Cold War was an international issue at the time. Um, and we involved, at the time, uh, uh, Pope John Paul. We involved... Uh, um, Gorbachev and uh, all these characters around the world uh, from 
82 to 92. It was an interesting time in history when we were dealing with uh, a tension. And that tension to me showed the leadership of, I'm just saying Ronald Reagan in my life. Uh, who is your favorite president besides Polk? Well, it's a difficult issue because uh, each of these individuals have good qualities and bad qualities. And to be perfectly honest, I think the greatest president uh, was and is George Washington. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've ever had someone of the caliber of that sort of man morally, intellectually, uh, who voluntarily gave up office at the height of his powers mm -hmm. and established the precedent so that we're not just another South American banana republic. We could very well have been, except for the model of George Washington. There was a lot of humility, uh, humbleness at certain levels at a certain time at the right time uh, for the formation of this country a long time ago. And I don't know if that was as humility was just a response to the oppression they felt from other countries, but it worked and it worked at the right time. Is America perfect? Nope. We have our faults, our failures. Um, we are not without sin, George. No, I'll, I'll disagree with you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Americans have fault and failures <laughs> and sin. The United States of America is a shining city on the hill endowed by God to lead the world into the bright uplands of the future. Well, that's Ronald Reagan. It's Americans, yeah. it's Americans <laughs> who screw up, not the United States of America. Well, uh, enough now about... Let's all stand and salute yeah, the flag right. and... <laughs> So let's uh, go through some news here. Um, uh, Cardinal McCarrick defrocked. Any comments? A long time in coming, and uh, this issue is not going to go away now that he's just Mr. McCarrick. Mm -hmm. um, our friends in the Catholic blockosphere and uh, the viewers of our show who are Roman Catholics are so exercised about the ongoing cover-up uh, of Cardinal McCarrick's sins. Now, as a man, I have pity and sorrow for him, and I pray for his soul, and he is in his, he's 88 years old. Um, I very much doubt anybody's going to try to put him in jail. He's spending the rest of his life in a Franciscan friary in the prairies of Kansas. And actually probably a good thing for him because he needs to get right with God. But at the same time, the institution that protected and promoted and you know, it's the same thing we see in the Episcopal Church and the Church of England. The old boy networks of uh, people of uh, similar ideologies or likes or inclinations to the exclusion of the Holy Spirit and the working of the Church. And that's the interesting thing. Everybody knew. That's, that's what hurts the most here. As, as a, uh, a brother in Christ and somebody who loves the Church, uh, loves... I, I'm in this... I'm all, I'm all in. When I see that, you know, a person like this where everybody knew what was going on and he was just one of the boys and, you know, like you say before, jobs for the boys here, uh, that really is what hurts the most, you know, that nobody stopped to say, we have accountability in this church and what you've done uh, is worthy of prison and you're not going to serve in an office as a cardinal. That would be ridiculous. Now that he has fallen and been defrocked, I... I suspect there's probably three or four other current cardinals uh, that may uh, end up in the same boat. It may be my attempt, but the first sort of national cause I got involved with in my Episcopal Church journey mm -hmm. was uh, Bishop Cy Jones, who was Bishop of Montana, and he was deposed for uh, adultery. And the issue that I got involved with, and I actually helped Bishop Jones at the time, uh, with uh, legal and scholarly research is that he confessed his sins to Ed Browning, the presiding bishop. And then Ed Browning said, ah, I'm sorry, uh, what you just confessed to me under the seal of confession, I'm rolling back that confession and I'm going to tell the disciplinary courts what you've done. Um, now, I don't want to get into the details of Cy Jones, but for me, the thing was, um, we need to have charity and uh, humility and not be judgmental of others because you know we are all sinners mm -hmm. that's not to excuse the sins of Carl McCarrick or Cy Jones because but when we pounce on these fallen people who have done awful things I think the devil rejoices oh I think you do. 
I don't disagree with that. I, I'm speaking more of the accountability, but uh, pff, sinner, raise my hand, you know, fallen, uh, repentant, fallen, repentant. Um, it's the nature, uh, not see, of the kingdom. But, it's a, you know. but it goes back to our little point about my point about the United States. Mm -hmm. It's not America that has problems. It's Americans. It's not the Catholic Church or the Episcopal Church that has problems. It's Episcopalians and Catholics. Mm -hmm. who through their fallen brokenness seek to to subvert the will of God, to, sub, to uh, ignore what is right and true and good out of fear or moral corruption or blindness. And if you were Cardinal McCarrick right now, you're 88 years old, you're the first Cardinal ever to be deposed. You're sitting in this fiery cell in uh, Kansas. Yeah, I mean... I'd be fearful the man's going to hang himself. But sure. again, I don't know him. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's a shame of what he's done. Sure. And what, uh, what he has allowed to happen under his watch. Looking here at some other news, it's uh, when I go for news, I go to Anglican.inc, you know, I, to get my Anglican news. And I thought, you know, on, on a slow story day like uh, President's Day, we could go through some of these. Uh, statement from the uh, Patriarch of Jerusalem um, following a meeting with Anglican leaders. What was that about? <sighs> don't tell um, me it's the most interesting news of the week <laughs> no it's not news um we have to understand that the orthodox world is very different from the episcopal world and the orthodox will use uh the anglican world when it is to their benefit mm -hmm. so uh the patriarch of jerusalem theophilus uh is in a weak political position in the world and he needs support from western leaders in his battle with the Israeli government over the expropriation and taxation of church properties. Now, meanwhile, Theophilus has a whole sack of stones that he's throwing at Anglicans over the gay issue, over women clergy issue. Believe me, Theophilus is no friend of Anglican ethics and ethos. Nope. But when there's an opportunity to have someone join him in pissing on the Israelis, Hey, here, 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 you're welcome to join us, pal. <laughs> no, it's, and, it, and for Justin and for Justin Welby, here's an opportunity to get out of the uh, the Anglican crisis to be seen as states statesmanlike and international and be received as an equal. And there's a photo where Welby just his social faux pas are just so continually well. He, he wears an Orthodox medallion. Um, None of the other Anglican bishops are wearing that. And but he, he he's. Do you remember? There's an episode of Yes, uh, Prime Minister, the old British TV show. Now, clearly, for for our listeners and, and viewers, George has probably watched every one of those episodes because I've seen like five in my lifetime. Well, there was an episode where Sir ha where uh, Prime Minister Hacker visits or Minister Hacker visits the Middle East, and when he gets there, his. Uh, civil servant uh, nemesis, Sir Humphrey, appears at a reception dressed, for Arab leaders, dressed in an Arab burnous. And there's a giggle, giggle, ha ha, but Welby does the same damn thing. Uh, he doesn't act as a representative of Anglicanism, he dresses up as a pseudo sloppy Orthodox cleric. So what do you really want me to think? tell you about this no, you, did, you did this a wonderful job i mean we're, we're having fun going through the news uh i see uh the texas supreme court requests briefs on the fort worth property case that never seems to end i know that south carolina is still in court uh trying to go through the system uh it's more of a uh an allen story but you know this is still going on george What's out of a Charles Dickens novels? John Dice versus John Dice, the never ending lawsuits that serve to enrich the attorneys. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's just such a disgrace to the world about how Christians treat each other mm -hmm. in the courts. You know, Paul had something to say about this, and what we are doing is not what Paul told us to do. Everyone who took Paul's advice seems to be better off. Just an observation. You know, from a reporter standpoint, sitting off here to the side, watching what goes on day to day within the church, outside the church, um, those who have followed his advice are further along. Just, it's an observation. Now, and here the sad thing is, on so many levels, but for me, the thing that I've experienced the most, 
um, because I talk to a great many people uh, as a, a reporter on these issues, and I also continue to talk to them, and it almost always turns into a pastoral conversation mm -hmm. of the deep hurt and emotional distress that these lawsuits have had on their lives, and it's an ongoing dispute. It's almost like talking to uh, someone after a, a divorce. Mm -hmm. The pain is still there. And if you've been married for 30 years and you get divorced and you have children and you're selling their house and everything, the pain and the amount of life disruption is so different from two dumb kids who got married and six months later, to, you know, it's not working. You get to keep the cat, I get the dog, and we're splits. This whole Episcopal Church scandal emotionally is the most been so destructive for the health and souls of people it is somehow it got away from itself like we talked about before Satan rejoices yeah. Satan rejoices sometimes yeah. there's a the lack of out there in this world yeah yeah it just unfathomable so let's talk a little bit we mentioned in the uh the opener that we're going to talk a little about uh communion partners uh there's certainly been a uh at times, wonderful uh, group of uh, uh, people in our church who've uh, tried to keep the faith, who yeah, at least on paper have stood up to some of the, the very destructive natures of the Episcopal Church and other things around the world. Um, however, for some reason, you have fallen out of favor with them. Uh, maybe uh, from what I can see, the Bishop of Albany Bishop Love has fallen out of favor with them. Um, and I thought we could talk about this a little bit. Why do we think you have fallen out of favor? Well, they're having a conference this coming week up at Camp Weed in the Diocese of Florida for clergy and uh, bishops and basically trying to chart a way forward. And uh, I was explicitly told I may not come. Hmm. I'm not welcome. I was told this by the Bishop of North Dakota. And in some respects, this is very awkward for me to talk about because essentially I'm complaining about not being invited to a party. So I sound like... Yeah, you sound like, you know, poor George is whining about that. But this is actually but, more significant in, in my idea about this. But in looking at, in thinking about and praying about the correspondence, there's for me a deep sadness because of the fear. And it's how I've, it's, maybe it's the way the Episcopal way of doing things is, but has been, but there's such a degree of fearfulness and desire to control. And one of the things that I'm fortunate is that nobody has ever been able to control me uh, in 25 years as being in the Episcopal Church. In mm -hmm. other words, you know, I've been involved in high-level disputes, public disputes, with uh, Frank Griswold and Catherine Shefford Shorey, and um, Kevin, you and I have been called, now press the bleep, we're just about, I'll, I'll share this, I don't think it's, oh, I'll go ahead and share it, I'm going to say expletive. The Archbishop of Canterbury informed members of the primates, I believe, was it was the 2017 uh, primates meeting in Canterbury? Uh, was that was, there, was a, there was a gathering there. Uh, the non-primates, the, the primates non-meeting, mm -hmm. uh, Justin Welby, and Kevin and I were uh, breaking news from within the primates meeting continuously because primates would get on the cell phone and talk to us from the men's room. You could tell it's the men's room because there's the echo. <laughs> Thank God. And we're reporting what's going on before it goes through the AC&S machine. And Justin Welby uh, told a gathering of the primates that Kevin and I were shits, uh, evil shits. Now, an evil shit like George, uh, if you're a priest under orders, under authority, I should have been squashed a long time ago. But nobody's ever tried or nobody's ever succeeded. Mm. And maybe that reputation, reputation as an evil shit has now spread over to the communion partner group who don't want me anywhere near uh, p perhaps I'm radioactive at this point. I don't know. Well, I th it's, and I've seen this before. I've seen those people who demand transparency, the people who demand that there's reformation in the church, um, have these list of demands, but they don't want that to apply to themselves. And so they'll have these meetings which are open to other press. Uh, I think Living Church will certainly be at this uh, event. Um, but they want people who are going to be friendly to their ideas and not going to 
be somebody who's um can you clarify what you're saying there so that you know people know what you're, you're really talking about they don't want that they just want to put a polished statement on and we've seen this everywhere i, I i've seen it in great organizations like the acna um, there are sometimes you want to circle the wagons and be sure what you say is absolutely perfect um, and beyond critique, and it never but, is. But see, here's, here's the important thing that uh, some of these people who are new to the game, and every time we get a new iteration of a new group of people, and the communion partners is the newest iteration of the conservative remnant, they have to go through a learning curve of how to play the game. I'll give you an example of how the game is played. Um, the Plano Conference, uh, way back when, just before uh, the start of the, uh, several years before the start of the uh, Anglican they, Union they, Network. They call that Plano One, I think. Plano One. Yeah. Uh, big event. I was there. Uh, and Bob Duncan and I and uh, was talking to me. He was, and the uh, AC, uh, his press officer was there, and Larry Stamers of the Los Angeles Times. Larry uh, is no longer an active reporter, but Larry is an Episcopalian. He attends All Saints in Pasadena, whose assistant rector is uh, well known to this show. Uh, I won't say anything more. Uh, <laughs> it's a liberal Episcopal parish, and Larry is a liberal Episcopalian. And Bob Duncan had just given a stem winder of a speech, and um, he's talking with us afterwards in the press, and Larry's got his tape recorder out, and I... I'm not as uh, uh, technologically savvy. I've got my notepad and the ACA, ACN press officer is there, and Bob's talking about the crisis in the Episcopal Church, and and Larry mentions, you know, the Rwandans are helping you, and and uh, he said, and Bob Duncan essentially said, yes, the Rwandans have experienced a crisis in their community, but you know what's happening to the Episcopal Church right now is actually worse than the genocide in Rwanda. And Larry clicks off his tape cassette player, and I lift my pen and I look at the uh, ace at the ACN press officer, and he goes, "Oh my God!" Because here's the headline: uh, you know, death of millions is as of nothing to the Episcopal Church's internal battles. Or we're, we're sure. that effect. And Larry said to Bishop, "Do you really mean that, or are you trying to say that it's the same?" degree of spiritual uh the, the the degree of spiritual uh hatred and animosity that eventually led in rwanda to the tutsis and the hutus murdering each other that sort of animosity animus is present within the life of the episcopal church and bob said yes that's exactly what i mean so well you had so now yes george conger uh, for the Living Church, I think, uh, and the Church of England newspapers, who I was writing for in those days, and Larry Stamer of the LA Times could have written these blockbuster, global, galactic exclusives uh, about how, you know, Bob Duncan thinks that genocide is not a big deal compared to what's happening in the Episcopal Church. But when you're dealing with reporters who know the topic and who are actually seeking the truth, so that the LA Times reporter could turn off his cassette and say, now, is this what you're telling me? And then turn the cassette back on. And so that, in other words, the idea, a good reporter is one who seeks the truth, not seeks uh, in, uh, fame, not seeks an intergalactic splash. No, um, we, we passed up a lot of intergalactic splashes in and, and the last that's five the thing. I mean, when you do this long enough, if you're not fair, mm -hmm. we had I, we had a little issue where once uh, where on AI I reported a story as true based on conversations I had with the primate in question. Well, the primate in question uh, was put on the spot by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the ACNS put out a story saying George Conger naming me and naming our publication are lying liars who've lied. Well. What, what what do I do? Do I make myself look good by saying, putting out to the world, here's the correspondence, and burning the archbishop who has uh, trusted me, or do I basically chalk it up as just part of the job? Because, and just go forward. And guess what? 
four, five, six years later, this archbishop talks to me all the time because he knows I've never burned him. Sure. And well, when you get these new people coming into the political fray who basically are neophytes and have no knowledge, I mean, they're used to running their parish and where they're king and their little castle and they can tell the secretary what to put in the newsletter and that's that. And then they get into the real world. The, these guys are at sea. And, and well. No, I mean, there's a truth to that. If you can't handle, you know, a minor player like Anglican TV or Anglican Inc. at your, your event, um, what are you afraid of? Well, I have to say, sometimes this is good for us. At the Lambeth 98 conference, uh, Andrew Carey, who was the, my editor at the time, ran a story about where he quoted uh, Jack Spong for saying the African church is basically one step up from the jungle, one step down from the trees. Uh, which uh, even Desmond Tutu, who was Mr. Super Liberal at the time, took offense to. And of course, uh, Spong denied this as an exaggeration, but it was great because we had it on tape. And, and maybe I didn't quite use that degree of fairness with Jack Spong that we used with uh, Bob Duncan, but um, Duncan, uh, the thing is, Spong denied saying it, and Spong, and that, but and Spong said, you know, the Church of England newspaper is a scurrilous rag that you can't trust whatsoever. And for years, the CEM used that statement as part of its advertising, just to get people to buy mag the newspaper. Because if Jack Spong hated us, it must be worth reading. Yeah, I mean, I don't. When you look at the big picture, I don't mind being reviled. You know, we certainly learned in scripture this week that, you know, it's okay to be reviled. Christ was reviled um, because we're not doing anything outside of the accordance of uh, holding our brothers accountable, you know. And uh, you are allowed, if you don't like it, you can complain about it. If we're wrong, you can correct it. That's just the nature of what we do. And George, in the last 500 episodes, we've probably been wrong on uh, at least three or four uh, stories, and we appreciated the correction. And you know that's that's the way it goes, George. We've just hit twenty nine minutes on a President's Day when nothing is going on. My son finally woke up, so we have a live studio audience. Good morning, Ben. I got the look. So <laughs> we should probably move on. Uh, George, you have a great week. Thank you. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 490 of Anglican Unscripted.